Order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for Social Development. And we will begin with 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mrs Sandra Overend. Mrs Overend. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister detail what discussions he had with John McPeak before, during and after his resignation as Chief Executive of the Housing Executive? Um, I had no discussions with uh, Mr McPeak in regard to that matter. Uh, Mr McPeak is employed by the Housing Executive. And as the member would be well aware, the Housing Executive has its own board, its own chairman, and its own chief executive. Um, so therefore, his resignation was tendered to his employers, i.e. the Housing Executive. Uh, I was made aware uh, of the fact that he was resigning, and uh, the matter rests there. Uh, the indication to me is that, uh, according to the chairman, he would be um, stepping down probably at the end of the financial year or possibly the, the, the actual year, calendar year. Uh, that matter is somewhat unclear. I call Mrs Overend for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister detail whether his previous much vaunted figure of a supposed £18 million overspend, something which now looks decidedly inaccurate and of which this House and the companies concerned may eventually be owed an apology over, played any role in any discussions that, you may, that the Minister may have had or any others may have had on your behalf with, with Mr McPeak prior to his resignation? Um, I find the supplementary question somewhat surprising, insofar as I have already said that there were no discussions uh, with Mr McPeak. So, uh, therefore, I think that the uh, supplementary uh, is somewhat irrelevant. I call Mr David Hildit. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, uh, could you outline how the, the Help to Buy scheme announced by the Prime Minister at the weekend uh, will work and whether it will be available in Northern Ireland? Um, yes, indeed. The um, Help to Buy scheme that was announced by the Prime Minister um, next week uh, the Help to Buy Mortgage Guarantee Scheme, originally announced by the Chancellor, in, in Budget 2013 will be available for applications. Uh, that scheme will operate right across the United Kingdom, and it will see the government and lenders guaranteeing up to 15 per cent of a property's value. It will allow potential buyers to purchase a home with a 5 per cent uh, deposit and the balance covered by a mortgage. Uh, there are several high street banks uh, that are, will be offering the new help to buy mortgages to customers. So far, RBS and uh, Lloyds have confirmed that they will participate. Uh, and the mortgages will range from 80 per cent to 95 per cent of the property's value, and there will be on a repayment basis. Borrowers will be subject to the usual affordability and income verification checks uh, normally conducted by lenders to ensure that they can afford the mortgage they are applying for. Call Mr Hildes for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for his answer. Uh, further to that, then, a, a number of commentators have suggested that the scheme could lead to a house price bubble. Uh, how will the government ensure this does not happen? Well, I think some of those concerns have been more directed towards the situation in London area and the south east of England, uh, as opposed to the north of England or indeed to Northern Ireland. Uh, but overall, um, every September, the government and the Bank of England Financial Policy Committee will be reviewing the impact of the scheme and examining whether the fees or the price cap should be adjusted. So uh, at the United Kingdom level, there will be that safeguard to ensure that uh, you don't get a house price bubble. But I think that in the Northern Ireland situation, it would be very unlikely anyway. Call Mrs Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the recent visit by the UN Special Rapporteur, Ms Rolnick? Well, the, the, the visit by the UN Special Rapporteur to the United Kingdom as a whole um, certainly generated a large amount of uh, newspaper coverage, uh, a large portion of which was extremely uncomplimentary towards Ms. Rolnick. Uh, I think it was the Daily Express described her as the Brazil nut, uh, and other newspapers followed in a similar line. Um, her Marxist pedigree seemed to uh, have influenced some of her, her comments. 
However, um, in regard to um, her visit to, to Northern Ireland, I think one of the things that uh, did strike me was uh, that uh, there was uh, a lot said afterwards in terms of detailed comment, but on the basis of a very short visit. And having seen her preliminary comments, uh, her final report will not appear until March next year. Uh, some of her views seem extremely ill-informed. I think someone coming from a country where you have tens of millions of people living in shanty towns is in a poor position uh, to comment on uh, the housing situation here in Northern Ireland. And, um, she might well have been better spending some time sorting out problems there where tens of millions of people in Brazil are living in appalling conditions. Call Mrs. Hale for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. And I, can the Minister confirm that Mr. Olnick's programme was organised in collaboration with the Practice and Partition of Rights Group and that she only visited one side of social housing from the community? I thank the member for that supplementary because she does raise a very um, significant issue there. Um, the Practice and Participation of Rights Project, which is a lobby organisation, um, seems to have had a key role in organising her visit. And it was noticeable that in the course of the one day that she spent here, um, she actually spent longer with them than she did with officials in either uh, the Department for Social Development or indeed uh, with the housing executive. It was also significant that uh, during the course of, of that visit, uh, I think she spent uh, two and a half hours in the afternoon touring the New Lodge area, the Seven Towers and Sailor Town. Now, she was here to look at the whole of Northern Ireland and yet she devoted two and a half hours to one specific area. I was interested also to note that when I spoke to community organisations in unionist communities adjacent to that, none of them had either been informed about the visit by PPR, they'd never been invited to any of the meetings, and she wasn't invited to their communities. I think it says a lot indeed about PPR and the operation that they carry out uh, in the fact that they excluded uh, unionist communities and only took her to a nationalist community. If we're dealing with housing issues, we need to deal with the whole community, unionist, nationalist and other. Everybody deserves a fair deal, but not in the eyes of some people. And if people are dealing with human rights issues, I thought that one of the human rights issues was the right to equality of treatment. That certainly doesn't seem to be the case in this instance. Call Ms. Megan Fearing for something. Um. Last thing, Corla. Um, given what the Minister has said today around the health to buy scheme and the, and the potential for a second house, bu housing bubble, sorry, does the Minister plan to increase the number of social housing units to meet the demand? Well, welcome indeed. The, 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 the question, and she raises, uh, the member raises the question of um, increasing the, the amount of social housing. Um, it's a matter that is very near to my heart, and it's one that I've put a lot of effort into. Uh, but the problem that we face there is that the uh, people who are meant to be delivering social housing in Northern Ireland, and that is through the housing associations, um, they haven't really stepped up to the mark. Um, the, the number of housing associations, I've dealt with this recently in, the, in the, the Chamber, we have about 30 housing associations in Northern Ireland. You have only about half a dozen of them who are really building. Some of them don't build at all. In fact, many of them don't build at all. Uh, you have a small number of building, and of those, an even smaller number who do the overwhelming majority of the new build. We need to have a situation where housing associations are really stepping up to the mark. I think they have a lot to learn from some of the housing associations in Great Britain, which are much more creative, much more imaginative, much more innovative. And if that were the case, I think we would be in a much better position in terms of delivery. It has been disappointing uh, to me, and in fact, I will be meeting with housing associations again in the not too distant future to press them. This. Met with them in the past and pressed them. Met with the housing executive as well and pressed them. Both the housing executive and the housing associations really need to be delivering more uh, if we are to attain or achieve the sort of targets that a member and myself would want to see uh, delivered. It is a sad situation when you have the money there to be spent you're not able to spend it. And in fact, quite often at the end of the year, there's a rush to buy off the shelf to make up numbers. That's not a good way of doing it. It's not a planned way. It's not the proper way to do it. It's the best way in the circumstances. But really, the problem is need to, needs to be tackled at its heart. Get the housing associations really building. 
Ms. Fearn for supplementary. I mean, I would ask Corlin, I thank the Minister for his answer. And given what he's just said, and with a waiting list of approximately 40,000 people, does he think that enough social housing has been built? And what key actions can we take forward to see results quickly? Well, in a sense, um, the, the answer I gave to the first question, in many ways, has dealt with part of the second. I would say this there are 40,000 people on the waiting list, but I could own a house in Coltraw worth a million pounds and still be on the waiting list? Yes, I do wish. <laughs> Not much chance of it. A person could be the owner of a house worth a million pounds or whatever a cultural and still put themselves down on the waiting list. Anybody can put themselves down. You could be there with no points. You could be on the waiting list with no points and you're still on the waiting list. You're dealing with actually a smaller number than, than the number that has been mentioned there in terms of real need. And that's why, of course, we deal with the issue of stress, people who are over 30 points rather than people who are possibly sitting there with no points or um, already homeowners. A person can be a homeowner in any situation and still put themselves onto the waiting list. So the, the, the figures that are often quoted can be somewhat misleading. But the real challenge here is that we get a situation where housing associations are facing up to the challenge uh, and are really delivering. We have a higher level of uh, housing association grant in Northern Ireland than in GB. Housing associations here are in a privileged position because of that, so we really need to see more delivery. And um, I had a, a very useful visit across to uh, Liverpool and Manchester not so long ago to see some of the work being done by housing associations there, not just in terms of their new build, but also some of their other initiatives, which were very imaginative. I would like to see more of that here. Call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. As the Minister responsible for delivering 10 shared neighbourhood projects as part of the OFM DFM Building a United Community strategy, can the Minister update the House on what neighbourhoods have been identified where and a timescale for their delivery? Um, in terms of the uh, issue of shared um, communities, and that's an issue that uh, members of the, uh, the Alliance Party uh, often seek to raise. Um, the, um, yes, indeed, absolutely. It's interesting, you know, I, I, I make the, the, the point often when this is raised. Segregation is not limited to social housing. There's as much segregation in private sector housing as there is in many areas in regard to social housing. And secondly, that um, social housing integration can only really take place where there is a desire and a willingness to do it. And in many places, that is not the case. For example, if someone is, um, if I come through the, the uh, West Link and I see a block of flats with the names of hunger strikers on it, and I see a block of flats with tricklers on the top of it, successful hunger strikers. It's, it says to me, I don't think people from the US community are going to feel very comfortable there. So quite clearly, certain communities have made a choice. Now, the aim is to have more shared communities developed and supported during the next uh, number of years. Um, and, and that is being taken forward. But I have to say, if you actually look at the example, even filling Spring Farm in Antrim, it has been a challenge to actually fill up what was brought forward as a shared scheme. And some other schemes, I'm not so absolutely sure that there is the huge appetite. But sometimes it's put forward. Um, I'm happy to, to come back to the member with uh, more details on, on where we are. We've got 11 shared new bill schemes uh, that I have there, the details of, I can give the member details of those. As regards to moving forward, I'm happy to come back to the member with more details, but I would not be as... Um, Minister, you are well over your time. That it will necessarily be delivered at some time. I'm afraid, Mr imagine. Little, you will have to have a very quick supplementary. Well, the Minister says he's not sure there's appetite for shared neighbourhoods. He seems to disagree with the First and Deputy yeah, First yeah, Minister yeah. then, given that their strategy sets out the need for 10 new shared neighbourhoods. So I would indeed be grateful for the information as to where they've been identified. What does the Minister think are, is a key feature of a shared neighbourhood scheme? Very quickly, Minister. Well, one of the key things, I think, might be actually getting people from both communities buying into it. And the point has been, and I point the member back again to Spring Farm, where 
applications were uh, invitations were sent out right across the province. It was a very, very slow process of getting people to buy into it. Now, there are some small schemes that have worked, and I'm aware of those, but they have tended to be very small, specialised in particular locations. We should be aspirational. It's right to be aspirational. And that's the point from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. We should be aspirational. But the reality, I think, also needs to be very much kept in mind. And I remember, remind the member again, when we see in private Minister, sector housing time the problem well of segregation, we shouldn't be surprised that it happens in social housing as well. Order. That ends the period for topical questions. We will now move on to oral questions that have been listed for the Minister. And before I call Mr Stephen Agnew, can I tell you that question four has been withdrawn? Mr Agnew. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number one, please. Yep. Over the past 18 months, my department has been working with representatives from North Down Borough Council, Town Centre Management and the local community to develop a major public realm scheme for both Bangor and Hollywood. Those works will address all aspects of street design, including paving, curbstones, street furniture, lighting and planting. The total value of the works is estimated to be £10 million, with my department investing £4 million and the Council investing £6 million. The design work for each time was completed with the help of many different stakeholders, and these schemes will build upon the individuality and unique attributes of each time. A contractor is due to be appointed in December 2013, and construction work in both towns will commence in late March, early April 2014. The Bangor scheme will take two years to complete, and the Hollywood scheme will take 12 months to complete. Throughout the construction phase, my department will continue to work with the local representatives and the wider community to keep them fully informed about the programme of works. Mr Agnew for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the information. Um, is he and his department aware of the alternative plans proposed by local architect Ian Holloway for Bangor Town Centre? And if so, what consideration has been given to these plans? Um, I am aware that an alternative um, proposal was put forward. And in fact, that proposal was looked at at an earlier stage. But it would have meant uh, removing um, vehicle traffic from uh, Main Street in Bangor. And that was uh, recognised as being um, inappropriate. The, the article in the Bangor Spectator from the architect um, I, I read, and as I say, his proposal was considered um, by the project board, but discounted because that removal of vehicle traffic from Main Street would have had a dramatically adverse impact on traffic flows. And that's an important issue that I'm sure local traders and local residents would be concerned about. Call Mr Peter Weir for supplementary. Deputy, uh, Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, will the same, material, same standard of materials and design also be used for the proposed Queen's Parade scheme uh, that the Department is taking forward? Um, I thank the member for the, for the question. And the answer to that is yes. Um, my department will ensure that the specification for the Queen's Parade scheme ties in with uh, the public realm works in Bangor. The Queen's Parade scheme represents a tremendous opportunity for Bangor. We're driving it forward uh, as a scheme, and the two need to mesh together so that you get the best uh, outcome for, for Bangor. Call Mr Leslie Cree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his um, timeline and cost. Uh, can the Minister advise when the detail of the scheme will actually be uh, available? For example, the types of trees, the type of the pavement, the decoration, the lights, all that sort of um, infrastructure? Well, le let me just run over the um, timeline that, that I gave there earlier uh, in response to the question. We said there that the contractor is due to be appointed in December 2013. Construction work starts in late March, early April 2014. I would assume that the, the member has been uh, because it confirmed here that uh, there has been contact with local representatives and the wider public to keep them fully informed about the scheme. That will continue. So those sort of fine details about what particular type of tree or what particular flowers go into a flower bed, all of those things will be discussed at a local level. Um, and I'm sure that the member will be part of that 
wider consultation uh, with those who are designing the scheme and taking it forward. Uh, I assume the member will have already had input and, and discussion with them, and I would encourage him to continue with that, because those things naturally can, can evolve even during the course of, of a scheme being taken forward. Can I remind members, please, who wish to be called for supplementaries that you must continue rising in your place? I call Mr Trevor Lunn. Is not in his place. Question four was withdrawn. I call Ms. Bronwyn McGatton, who is in her place. Very well. Good question five. Thank the member for the um, question. In 2012, I commissioned a high street task force to review the support provided by my department to town and city centres to see if this could be further strengthened. That task force report was published in February of this year and contained seven recommendations uh, for my department going forward. The report commended the Living Over the Shop scheme as an example of a programme that should be extended through my department with a focus on regeneration-led town centre living to bring after-hours vitality to the high street. My department's new urban regeneration and community development policy framework establishes town and city centre regeneration as a key policy priority, and the housing strategy sets out my intention to revitalise the Living Over the Shops initiative and to ensure synergy with our mainstream urban regeneration initiatives. I believe that housing can play an important role in helping to diversify and re-energise our town and city centres and the development of a regeneration-led approach will help to bring people back to town centre living and could bring an added value dimension by bringing vitality to Northern Ireland's high streets after normal trading hours and help to promote uh, the evening economy. It was called the Lot Scheme Living Over the Shops. I think going forward we'll be looking for an alternative name because you were looking here for a scheme that is broader than simply living over the shops. <coughs> Call Ms. McGahan for a supplementary. I, I thank the Minister for his response. Can I ask the Minister, has he considered the impact on commercial businesses when part of a business area is turned into a housing area? Well, I would be interested to know what concerns the member has in, in that regard. Uh, I'm sure the member hasn't raised it with me in the past, but I would be I am um, happy to hear if there are particular concerns. Um, if you look across the British Isles, there are many town centres where um, commercial and residential um, accommodation um, do fit together. And I think it depends very much on the nature and the style. I, I can remember some years ago uh, the, the, the difficulties there were in Belfast where you had uh, a block of apartments up above uh, a late night uh, hot food takeaway and it tended to attract people from a, uh, a bar nearby in the early hours of the, of the morning and there was conflict there between the residents and of course the, the, um, the, the noise and uh, disruption associated with the business. So it, it's dependent on the type and the place and that's why we have planning laws to make sure that we get the right result hopefully. Call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Uh, Minister, what grants are available to target derelict or vacant town centre properties to help bring them back into productive use and also help to enhance the commercial viability of existing properties? Again, uh, thanking the member for, for, the, for the question. Uh, the reference here really is to the Urban Development Grant Scheme. The UDG scheme was developed to encourage private sector investment in towns and cities by offering financial assistance to bring into use vacant sites or buildings that are derelict or underused. UDG assistance can be up to 35 per cent of grant eligible costs for owner-occupier schemes or up to 35 per cent of total development costs for investment schemes. The remainder of the capital is provided by the applicant through private funds or bank loans. 
The Regional Development Office has offered uh, grant assistance on a number of UDG applications that included the creation of new accommodation in town centres. Call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I welcome uh, the Minister's intent to uh, improve upon the Living Above the Shops initiative. Uh, if he has not already done so, will the Minister give a commitment to write to the Minister of Finance in relation to the possibility of zero uh, fat uh, or fat refunds to uh, those who would renovate properties, particularly in town centres, to actually make it a, a more attractive proposition? Well, I have no doubt that the Finance Minister reads every last word of oral questions every day. And the point that the member has made, I'm sure, will be taken up by him. I'm sure he'll listen to it, and uh, he will then give it consideration after he has read it. Uh, and I'm sure he will uh, be aware that she has raised that point today. Call Mr Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your answer uh, so far. Specifically in relation to grants, Many properties above shops, I'm thinking of two uh, areas in my own constituency, both in Larne, Main Street and Carrick Fergus, uh, High Street and West Street, where properties do not have separate entrances at street level. Does the grant scheme extend to providing for that as well? Um, I said in, in an earlier answer there that we are looking to develop a new scheme. Um, and if people, uh, if individual members have issues that they want to raise. Um, certainly, um, we would welcome those suggestions uh, that, that might be fed into that. Uh, and I can appreciate the point that the memory makes. Quite often, shops that previously had a side entrance to upstairs have, over the years, removed that to extend their, their shop frontage. And you can see examples of that even in, in Royal Avenue in Belfast there, where it may be six stories above shops that are, are virtually, therefore, inaccessible, other than from the rear. And it depends on the location what the right outcome is, but certainly I welcome the, the point that I think the member is generally supportive of the initiative, and I accept that we'll, we'll certainly take an interest in the point he's made. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Thank the member for, for his question. Um, as I previously advised the House, the Housing Executive has appointed an external consultant to independently review the alleged overpayments, and their report is still awaited by the Housing Executive. The Chairman of the Housing Executive stated in June that the investigation would specifically review how the situation arose, the reliability of the information on overcharging, and the actions taken to recover the overpayments. Since the report was not commissioned by myself or my department, but was commissioned by the Board of the Housing Executive. Uh, I will, of course, expect to be briefed on the findings by the Housing Executive in due course. The Housing Executive has advised that they are continuing to work with the contractors to reach an agreement on the quantum of any overpayment. And when this work is complete, the Housing Executive will consider what further actions, if any, are then required. I call Mr. Allister for a supplementary. Could I direct the Minister back to the question? The question was, Given that four contractors have been blocked from further contracts in consequence of the alleged 18 million saga, what action was taken in respect of the housing executive directors who oversaw that alleged situation? How is it that one of the primary directors in charge went on, in fact, to become chief executive? The minister, in collaboration with the chairman of the housing executive, was able to secure a blockage on the four contractors getting further work. In collaboration with the housing executive, did he take, order, any, steps, order, did he take any steps to penalise the directors who were in charge? Uh, to correct the member, I did not stop contracts being taken forward. The member is well aware, is well aware this is entirely a matter for the housing executive. So I welcome the opportunity to correct Mr Allister, to set the record straight and hope that he is now better informed yeah, yeah. about the situation. Um, the fact is that as regards the um, people who were involved in the, this problem, um, whether it be on the contracts, contractor side or on the housing executive side, uh, the member is aware 
because I've just said it, that a report has been uh, commissioned by the housing executive. They are looking into it. They have commissioned the report. It was the chairman of the housing executive who took that forward. That report um, will be with us fairly soon, or will be with the executive, rather, fairly soon. Uh, and indeed, my expectation is that that would be with the chair of the housing executive uh, within the next number of days. And in due course, when the housing executive has had the opportunity to review that, uh, they will then take whatever action they think uh, as a board is appropriate. Um, I think that it's important that we distinguish between the role of the department and the role of the housing executive. And so I do indeed truly welcome the opportunity to set the record straight and to correct the member. Again. Call Mr. Michael Copeland. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and I, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. C could he detail, given the fact that a number of companies are disbarred from applying for contracts due to the overcharging or overspending, depending on how you look at it, and should the scale of these alleged activities prove to be less than had previously been anticipated? Um, would he accept that there is a likelihood at some stage in the future of companies who have found themselves disbarred on that basis uh, feel slightly um, unjustly treated and seek recourse in law, challenging the actual contracts that may be issued during the period of their disbarment? And does he feel that there are any contingencies that are necessary within either the executive or the department to um, order, deal please, with that? Order, please. Can I remind all members, please? that supplementary questions have got to be brief and they've got to relate to the original question. Minister. I think it's important uh, to repeat again that the housing executive commissioned external consultants to produce a report, Campbell to Kell being the, the folk who are taking forward that piece of work. And it's premature of anyone in advance of the receipt of that report, the examination of that report, to set out all sorts of potential eventualities. It was stated at the time that the initial figure that was produced and given for out publicly by the chair of the housing executive, and which I then reported to the House, was in the region estimated at that time by means of an extrapolation from, from uh, uh, samples that were taken, it was in the region of £18 million. It may be, and I said that at the time, it may be a bit less than that. But it doesn't matter whether to me whether it's £2 million, £5 million, £10 million or £18 million. It shouldn't happen. Yeah. Call Mr Dominic Bradley. Um, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, can I ask the Minister when he expects the report to be published so that we know, in fact, the actual accurate figure? Well, I've said already in answer to, to a previous question that we anticipate uh, from information provided by the housing executive that they will have uh, the report uh, within uh, a matter of days. They will then, of course, want to take that to their board. Now, their normal board meeting would be towards the end of this month. Uh, we're into the month of October. Their meeting is normally towards the end of the month. But it might well be that if the report raises very substantial issues, and it may well do so, that indeed they would want their board to meet at an earlier date in the month. Because this is a matter of concern to uh, the general public, to politicians, to contractors, to the housing executive, to everyone. So therefore, um, it, it will be a matter of them bringing it to their board as soon as possible. I haven't seen the report yet, but I expect to be briefed in due course on the findings and on what action will be taken. And I can assure the uh, member that uh, whatever uh, the outcome is will be relayed to uh, this House. Call Ms Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Um, could the Minister tell us uh, what is the position at the moment uh, regarding letting new maintenance contracts? Um, as regards the, the letting of new maintenance contracts, the housing executive has advised that um, a number of planned schemes were let under the current arrangements prior to the 27th of January 2013. These schemes are ongoing. It is hoped that they will be complete by the end of the year. 
and once procurement procedures are completed, new contracts will then be let. Call Mr. Ian Mill. Question 7. Um, Dr Litchfield's fourth independent review of the work capability assessment has not yet been completed. He is currently at the evidence gathering stage of his review, which includes considering if more can be done to ensure that the assessment process is both effective and perceived as being objective by all stakeholders. As part of this process, I launched a call for evidence in Northern Ireland on the 10th of July 2013, and this gave everyone with an interest in how the work capability assessment process operates the opportunity to submit their views and comments on how it could be improved. There were a total of 48 responses from interested parties in Northern Ireland, and that evidence has now been collated and passed to Dr. Litchfield for uh, consideration. Um, I met Dr. Litchfield during his visit to Northern Ireland on the 18th and 19th of September, and as part of his evidence gathering. Uh, and he advised that Northern Ireland operational processes did appear to operate better here than in Great Britain. And I found that encouraging that his assessment was that we're actually doing it better in Northern Ireland than the folks in, in Great Britain. In addition to meeting myself, he also met with members of the Social Development Committee, Social Security Agency staff, uh, adults health care and customer representative groups. His independent report will be laid before the Assembly by the end uh, of the year. Call Mr. Millen for supplementary. For my good, I'll ask him, Collier, I just, uh, thank the Minister for his question thus far. As the Minister is aware, there's a lot of concern regarding the assessment uh, process. Can the Minister reassure us uh, that uh, protections have been put in place um, to ensure that people are treated properly during and after the assessment? I can thank the member for, for the, the point he raises there. One of the key things to bear in mind, I suppose, is that Dr. Litchfield's report is the fourth. There were three prior to that, taken forward by Malcolm Harrington, um, and Professor Harrington was also an occupational health specialist. Um, all of the recommendations that were brought forward by Professor Harrington, I think all of them now have been implemented, and that's why, um, because of implementing those and because of initiatives taken forward internally here within Northern Ireland, within the department, we have, I think, a better arrangement than, than across in, in, in GB. Uh, but all of those recommendations have been taken forward, and whatever emerges from Dr. Litchfield's report will also be taken forward. I want this to be done in a way that ensures that we have uh, an appropriate uh, and empathetic uh, system in Northern Ireland that is right for our circumstances. Call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Can I ask the Minister, though, has he communicated the very specific details and circumstances around uh, Northern Ireland uh, compared to GB, given the fact that we have so many people who suffered uh, horrendous injuries as a result of the Troubles? Um, indeed, the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland, um, and there are a number that are different to some extent here from, from GB. Um, we do have higher levels of mental health illness that, than in Great Britain. Um, and whilst there are other areas in, in England that would have similar profile to Northern Ireland, areas in the north of England, um, heavily industrialised areas there, um, that would be similar in many ways to parts of Northern Ireland. Nevertheless, the member's right. We do have a legacy here in Northern Ireland of people who were the victims of terrorist violence down through the years. It's important that their interests are um, safeguarded. And in fact, one of the things I did on, uh, in, a, in a different context was when um, Lord Freud was over uh, and we were discussing the whole issue of welfare reform generally, uh, I made the point there of bringing the Victims Commissioner uh, and several victims to, to meet uh, with, with him. And that was actually a very productive meeting, and it was well received by those who had been the victims of terrorist violence uh, and also by the Commissioner. So we've actually got a very good relationship there. And it was interesting because you were dealing there with two victims who came, one who had suffered way back at the early part of the Troubles in the Abercorn bombing, another person who had been injured in a bombing much later on in the Troubles. So um, 
I thought that was very helpful, and we certainly have very much in mind the particular circumstance of Northern Ireland, whether it be mental health or the troubles. I call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can the uh, Minister outline any training that is undertaken by the health professionals who would conduct the medical assessments? Again, thanking the member for, for the question. Once recruited, health care professionals undergo training targeted to the benefit areas they are working in. They are then subject to audit and only have their appointment confirmed when they consistently achieve four A-grade reports. Ongoing monthly national audits are carried out using an agreed sample size, which has been approved by the Department. New entrants are provided with a personal training plan within three months of their formal approval, and they receive anti-discrimination training and mental health training uh, in their first year. Adults Healthcare is obliged to develop and deliver a professional training programme for continuing professional development as part of their contract. And this programme is developed, delivered and evaluated on an annual basis. A training needs analysis is carried out to identify training needs and priorities and provided to the Social Security Agency by the 1st of April each year. Once the outcome of this has been agreed with the agency, an outlined training plan is then produced by the 1st of June, giving an overview of the training programme for the coming year. Adults are also required to audit areas relevant to training modules undertaken to ensure that the principles of training have translated into good practice. No point in having the training unless it's worked through in practice, and to summarise those results in an annual report. Call Mr. Jonathan Craig. Question number eight, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I do thank the member for the question because I absolutely agree with the member. It is disgraceful that certain housing associations do not properly consult with MLAs and locally elected representatives. And that concern that the member has raised has been raised by a number of, of other elected representatives, uh, and it's one that, that I can well appreciate. It's imperative that housing associations consult with MLAs and locally elected representatives before any scheme is finalised. Housing associations are required by the Housing Association Guide to ensure that adequate structures are in place to consult all appropriate stakeholders, including prospective neighbours, when considering new projects and purchases of property or land, irrespective of how these purchases are funded. The consultation exercise must be appropriate to the type and scale of the scheme proposal and conducted in a time frame that allows for real engagement and resolution of issues. The Housing Association Guide suggests this should be a minimum of six weeks. Further consultation is a prerequisite for scheme and grant approval. Sorry, furthermore, consultation is a prerequisite for scheme and grant approval by the housing executive. Typically, associations may choose to write to MLAs, councillors, and neighbours to advise on development proposals. But I'm not happy with this, and I plan to do some work around the Housing Association Guide, and to whom housing associations must consult. Uh, when they are considering a scheme for developing. Uh, there are some examples of housing association good practice in this, but I want to ensure that there is a consistency of uh, approach across the sector. Uh, they may, if appropriate, follow up with public meetings, uh, and that would be useful as well. But genuine and earlier consultation is critical to the success of social housing schemes, and if the member has specific evidence of housing associations not undertaking consultation as required in the guide, then I would ask that he provides that information to my officials who will investigate. Call Mr. Craig for supplementary. I thank the Minister for that detailed answer, and I can give him both good and bad examples of consultation with housing associations. But could the Minister outline who actually approves the consultation process with housing associations? Um, the consultation policies and procedures used by housing associations are approved by the boards of each of the housing associations, and housing association staff are required to advise their organisation's development committee of the outcome of uh, each consultation exercise. However, uh, as, I, as I indicated there in the initial answer, it is a matter that I have taken a particular interest in because of issues that have been raised. And, um, we are determined to take some work forward in that regard to ensure that when a grant is being given out, it's in response to the needs of a scheme which has been well consulted on. 
And I think one of the points here is that local elected representatives bring a breadth and a knowledge of the local situation that people in a housing association, which may well be based many, many miles away, would not have. The MLA, the council, will be working in that area day by day, week by week, year after year. They have built up a body of knowledge about the area. They know the local communities, and that advice should be sought. And it's wrong if a housing association doesn't seek that local knowledge to benefit from it. 